write the history of modern science without discussing the work of people like Copernicus, Galileo, Descartes, and Newton, who, I must admit, truly revolutionized our understanding and our attitudes with respect to nature. Yet, even as we appreciate their foundational contributions, the scientific revolution as defined by historians of science after the Second World War has now become an obstacle in our attempts to make sense of the global extent of modern science. And I believe, therefore, we must forget about the scientific revolution as defined by historians in order to appreciate the enormous impact of modern science in societies all over the world. Of course, it's not my purpose here to deny that something momentous and extraordinary happened during the so-called scientific revolution. But I question the meaning usually attached to that event. To sum up, scientific revolution is often regarded as the birth of modern science. Well, this narrative, I believe now, is a myth. It is untrue, it is misleading, and it is based on a Eurocentric conception of science. Clearly, there was no unique and singular point in history where and when modern science was created. Even in European perspective, science can be said to have originated as much in the 14th century as in the 19th or 20th. The scientific revolution of the 17th century was neither a necessary nor a sufficient condition for the emergence of modern science. Now, this argument is hardly new and has been expanded forcefully by other historians. So in this brief presentation, I want only to draw attention to three new approaches in historiography that can help us to leave the narrative of the scientific revolution, as we have taught this for so many years, behind us. First, I believe it is mandatory that we redefine the nature of science. Most textbooks on history of science adopt a very narrow view of science, and we, we often define it as a systematic set of ideas and practices about the natural world based on a mechanical worldview, mainly driven by mere curiosity. Now, this is a rather academic view of science, and it hides from view a more complex reality in the construction of knowledge, in which, and this I think is important, in which many different knowledge regimes and knowledge holders confront each other. Even when science emerges as the dominant knowledge regime, this is often the result of a negotiation process to which many stakeholders have contributed their expertise. So we need to acknowledge this process and to include it in our historiography. There is not one science, there are many knowledge regimes which are in a, an unclear balance uh, with each other. Second, to widen the scope of our historiography, we need to reconsider the role of science in the circulation of knowledge between geographical regions or social communities. What seems all important in one community may be considered futile or even harmful in another. What is actually circulated when we circulate scientific knowledge? What would be the desire for scientific knowledge in other communities? Circulation of knowledge is fundamentally, I think, based on what is considered useful knowledge. Could be useful for technology, but also useful for the organization of state administration, for the safety of food supplies, distribution of medical care, the coping with natural disasters, strengthening of military force, or even the production of luxury objects. Science was never the primary objective. It was uh, circulated in order to provide this improvement of uh, other communities. And finally, my third point is, we need to rewrite our histories of science from a non-European perspective. It is not enough, as is sometimes believed, that we document the contribution of non-Western societies to our Western science. What we really need are histories of modern science written from a non-Western perspective. We always write our history of science uh, starting in antiquity with the Greeks and so on, and perhaps uh, the Arab world included. But we can just as well write a history of science in South America, where we start uh, a thousand or two thousand years ago, when we see how modern science then uh, 
um, uh, emerged in, in, in Latin America, for instance. We need histories written from a non-Western perspective. I refer here to the standpoint historiography as advocated by feminist historians and philosophers such as Sandra Harding. We need histories of science in India, Egypt, Japan, China, Mexico, Argentina, not with reference to the invasion of Western knowledge, but with reference to the particular long-term tra trajectory of each of these countries and populations and communities. If we ever hope to forge a new grand narrative for the history of science, it can only be a narrative that provides room for all, in which everyone can feel at home and that responds to the common heritage of all the world's populations. That's my uh, brief presentation. We can have a discussion afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Gertz. Uh, I will now quickly pass the word to uh, Clemens Montan, that is professor in the School of Mathematics and Statistics at the University of Canterbury, Christchurch, New Zealand. She has research interests in the mathematical history of several early cultures, including Mesopotamia, Greece, India and the Islamic Near East. Professor Montelli will present the paper, The Future of History of Science and Technology in New Zealand. Please, Professor Clemency Montel, we are willing to hear you. Thank you so much for that gracious introduction, Fabiano. So, tena koto, tena koto, tena koto katoa, e te mana whenua, tena koto katoa. Ko araki, te manga, ko arahura, te awa, ko sura, te waka, no na popo araki ora aho, ko clemency, toku ingoa, no rera, tena koto, tena koto, tena koto katoa. What I've just delivered for you right now is what we call a mihi or a pepiha, which is in Māori, the indigenous language of New Zealand, for the um, uh, indigenous culture that arrived um, uh, long ago. I do so because in recent years, as we look towards the future of, of, of the academy and indeed our communities within New Zealand, we're looking at uh, the ways in which we are even more alive to the potentials and possibilities of um, being a, a treaty responsive country, the treaty that we signed, um, that is signed between the Māori and um, the arrival of the British later on. And so, so I know that one of my colleagues from New Zealand has spoken, spoken earlier in this segment, um, Anne-Marie Jackson from the University of Otago, looking at indigenous knowledge, histories of science, and looking at it for well-being, and actually looking at the ways in which we can boost indigenous knowledge and understanding these knowledge structures within our country is a way in which we can celebrate our day. actually do so with you know there are many challenges and issues to be worked through but I do so with real optimism for the future as I as I look at the ways in which this biculturalism and this what we call te tariti, treaty responsiveness um, towards our, um, our biculturalism in this country is moving forward so um Greetings from New Zealand in the evening. I, I have, as we look towards the future, I've got, so New Zealanders are quite um, notorious for liking to feel like they punch higher than their weight. Uh, we're a team of five million. And of course we were, we were quite proud of ourselves over the COVID years for some, some fairly swift and um, firm policies around um, public health and science communication. And so um, that sort of, that sort of filters into the academy as well. So it's with, I'll just share my screen. It's with real, um, excitement that I um, announce a bit of a plug for um, when we look at the very near future of the history of science within New Zealand. Absolutely delighted to have pitched um, the competitive bid to host the 27th International Congress of the History and Science of Technology in New Zealand. So we feel particularly proud being quite a small country, the bottom of the Pacific, to be um, hosting this very prestigious event um, the second time only that it's been held in the Southern Hemisphere, as, as far as I know. And of course, New Zealand, for those of you, uh, is known for its evolutionary distinctive flora and fauna, its real dynamic uh, geology <laughs> with volcanoes going off and the ground shaking under our feet quite, quite, quite frequently. 
But really some of our pioneering industries, I think, and medical innovations in this country, again, come, coming from a very small self-determined nation, again, that feels very proud of some of the achievements that, 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 that are punching higher than their weight. Um, so New Zealand, I think, has a lot to offer despite its geographical distance and, and, and the voyage that you must make to come here for history of science um, enthusiasts and experts in this country. I think the, the, this country's contribution to the history of science and technology really began properly when the Māori, our very first arrivers on the New Zealand um, uh, uh, shores, use the sky and oceanographic knowledge in ways which is um, wrapped around prodigious feats of the arts of memory, around astral law and navigation and the like, to voyage across these vast distances in the Pacific Ocean to make it down to this particular area. So as such, we are we're planning for a very full conference. We're working provisions for around about a thousand delegates delegates to participate in this really exciting program. Of course, we keep it very broad because the history of science is as broad, of course, as, as all of the disciplines that we might find in the academy. And I think you will find, and I'll talk in, in, a, in a little bit, about the, the flavour of the history of science um, in New Zealand and where we think we're going. But we've loosely themed it, people, places, exchanges and circulation. It seems rather apt for being you know, a place where you'll have to um, come and exchange and, and, and travel to to get here. I think one of the most important trends we recognise in the field of the history of science, technology and medicine has been moving towards more integrated and expansive and connected histories, just as our previous speaker, our Professor Geert van Pimmel, was talking, um, that actually seek to include the participation of the entire world. Now, it's not just enough to look at a history of science, which includes some of the very familiar names, but from my own research, to actually look at how we can support and value and celebrate histories of science in India, for instance, and in China, we're talking about the direct scientific legacy and those two major superpowers nowadays of one, you know, a third of the world's population now. This is something that really needs to be brought much more in the mainstream. We have a responsibility um, to be able to do that more generally. So we felt well poised, despite our smallest, to be able to really emphasize that importance of um, inclusivity and participation of the entire world when we're looking, we're casting our net um, for relevance in the history of science. So we're really trying to um, strive to further this and link different disciplines and perspectives. And particularly, we want to provide an opportunity for these indigenous voices, particularly those of Māori to be heard in ways which we're really strongly encouraging um, as a community and a society in New Zealand. So, and so we will look at the importance of situating local knowledge and practices in specific contexts as this. We'll look at local and regional history of science and technology. So if you're curious in what happens in the antipodes and the history and science and technology, we're going to make sure that there'll be a real um, learning experience um, for those who, who, who want to understand, who broaden their knowledge um, beyond sort of the north, northern hemisphere shores. So what difference does a global perspective make will be pushing? How does, how does that, in this world of globalization, how can we actually promote our regional studies um, and, and make them relevant in the history of science, technology and medicine? So we're looking at circulation. We're looking at um, the breadth and these global ideas. How the interaction can actually result in new forms of inquiry, new configurations in the history and science and technology, and but also media, mediators between producers and consumers around the world. So... Um, what I will comment on is that, um, uh, as Anne-Marie Jackson may have talked about um, this morning, I think, um, you know, the humanities and the ways in which the history of science of, and technology um, and philosophy of science um, hook into the academy um, does so in different ways across the world. Our, our Australian brethren just across the Tasman Sea um, and their big well-endowed universities are often very fortunate to have um, dedicated units called history and philosophy of science with either degree programs or minors or ways in which they fit in with more general science and philosophy degrees. In New Zealand, we're not, we, we, we perhaps don't have the critical mass to be able to boast any particular unit in history and philosophy of science per se that is named. So, but what you will find, I think, is, is, is interesting and valuable in and of itself. You will find those whose research passion is the history and philosophy of science, but are embedded in more specific departments, be it in a medical school, 
or for instance in my case um, in a mathematics department so very happily I will teach you know calculus and linear algebra to engineers and physicists um, and I love doing that but my research passion and my speciality which I do bring into my teaching and of course it drives my research is the history and philosophy of science particularly in um, early societies so we also see we've got others if there's a there's a critical mass of um, amazing work being done at the University of Otago as well with Hugh Slotten, who looks at science communication and media. Um, and that has just published a book in 2022, Beyond Sputnik, Hamish Spencer, who's also a biologist, but does history of eugenics. So he's very much ensconced in there. Um, Catherine Abu Nama in Victoria, who is in the history department, but whose speciality is early modern history of science. And she's working on some very interesting um, figures in the Dutch history um, of science in early modern period. Um, we've had a lot of work being championed by Ruth Barton up in Auckland, who still remains active and um, a real agitator for the field. Um, so what, what we do find in New Zealand, and I think we'll, we'll treat it as a feature rather than a bug, is that a group of really passionate and dedicated scholars who, who aren't sort of together in a critical mass, but are spread throughout disciplines and infuse those particular disciplines. So I suspect the future of, of history and philosophy of science within New Zealand will be to actually fortify those positions, I, just, just, just because of our size and our scale, just keep an eye on the time, and um, to be able to um, look at strengthening, just as our conference intends to do, to look at that interdisciplinary aspect. I think a lot of us in New Zealand, as we look towards the future and how we can connect and make ourselves stay relevant within our particular disciplines, is that we respond to the increasing need for our graduates in our universities and our research programs for them to become more quantitatively literate and better at communicating the ideas and the things that they're learning. And so for many of us, we find that our skills as historians and philosophers of science become a tool for actually um, breathing human the humanities into the more distinct scientific disciplines and being able to... Um, to, to reach broader audiences that, that, that way. Um, you will find at most of the major universities, there'll be at least one course or maybe two in the history or philosophy of science in which these great ideas can be seen. So we will continue that. I think that's, 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 a, that's a very good achievement and it's responding to student needs and, and working in parallel alongside. So quite perhaps quite different to what you might find at large institutions across the Northern Hemisphere, and as I said, even for our Australian universities. But I think given our size and our, our happiness to, again, punch above our weight, um, that sort of approach is it's one that is probably the most sustainable as we look forward to New Zealand. Sabine, I think, oh, you have yes. five minutes. All right. I have five minutes left, do I? Okay. Sabine, no, so I've done, see, sorry. <laughs> Sabine, it's <fine. laughs> <laughs> No worries. So, um, so I'll just, yeah, I won't take too long then. Um, so there's an argument, I think, for having people in different departments and programs involved in the field in New Zealand. I think it, it, it's a very healthy position to be in in many ways to, to connect more broadly with um, the, the ebbs and flows of scholarship within New Zealand. My own particular, so um, what's, uh, what's also um, interesting is that just by dint of um, uh, expertise and interests, we do have a coverage sort of from very early times, I suppose I'm the one that probably studies the most earliest cultures of inquiry, starting with the very ancient Near Eastern forms and the emergence of writing, but most particularly in, um, India, the history of mathematics and the astral sciences on the Indian subcontinent. And so, um, you know, that, that, that's an interesting um, combination given that, um, you know, a lot of work on the history of science in India is increasingly um, picking up speed within India itself. And digital, um, digital humanities and the ability to scan documents um, and the like is really um, helping international collaborations and access to source material for people not just in India, but um, across the world to be able to engage um, and, and work like that. So there's a real optimism, I think, too, for the, the ways in which the contours of our communications within history of science, both with respect to the artifacts that we look at, be they manuscripts, be they instruments, um, uh, or original source material, and how, they, how we connect them to the original um, lectures. But just like for um, boosting indigenous knowledge within this country and empowering Māori to be... Um, 
to look at their own um, uh, scientific whakapapa and the like, um, we can learn lessons, I think, for when we look at, you know, particularly in my work, when we look at um, how we might do the same for promoting the study of the history of science within some of our neighbours, such as the South Pacific, such as Australia, such as even India, Southeast Asia and other places. And we're just learning how much important information, again, drawing on your point, Gert, um, how much important information and contributions that these cultures inquiry are making to the history of intellection and can enrich our perspective more. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Fabiana. I'll stop, my, I'll stop sharing my screen. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Clemency. And now we will pass the word to Zabine Perra. Zabine is a professor of science and technology studies and the head of department of philosophy and history of the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. Her research addresses the intersections of techno-science and environmental history, especially the art and space science in the 19th and 20th centuries, with historical studies of the rise of atmospheric physics, of satellite oceanography in global climate change research, and of space ecology and terraforming. Professor Holler's presentation entitles Anthropocene History. Please, Professor Hillers. The floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Fabiano. Thank you, everyone who has spoken, the two speakers. Can you hear me well? All right. Um, so I'll, I'll share my screen as well and try to get a, um, a presentation up that you should now see. Um, and uh, yeah, I speak to you from Stockholm, Sweden. Um, about Anthropocene history uh, as a suggestion of how we could think about the future of history of science and technology. And uh, I think it fits very nicely actually to um, what our previous speakers have already have um, proposed. Um, well, I do think I speak from the periphery a little bit, coming from Sweden. It's a rather, well, it's geographically large, but it's population-wise a small country in the north of Europe. Um, and when I say speak uh, the power of the periphery here, I refer to Peter Anker's book, which some of you might know. It's uh, called The Power of the Periphery, How Norway became an environmental pioneer for the world, uh, published in 2020. So Sweden, like Norway, in a way is dependent on, on international collaboration. It, so sweet, uh, English is the, is the dominant language, actually, in, uh, in our ac academy. And we also depend very much on uh, um, pooling of resources um, for history of science and technology, uh, the Swedish National Committee for the History uh, of Science and Technology unites departments all over the country. I'm also a member, my department is a member, and this is, I guess, why I'm representing Sweden here. Um, I do think that there's also um, a need to focus, um, and uh, for Sweden, from in my perspective, in the 20th and 21st centuries, um, the, uh, the, the history um, of the climate sciences has been expanded into a focus on global environmental change. So particularly Stockholm, where I'm based, has a long legacy as a global hub, working with questions on global environmental governance internationally from the UN conference on the human environment in Stockholm in 1972 to the Stockholm Resilience Center, for instance, founded in 2007, and then also uh, various large programs, Future Earth Network, uh, and the, the I Hope, the, um, the Integrated History and Future of People on Earth. Um, that international research network um, is based uh, also in Stockholm. And, uh, and uh, a fourth uh, perhaps characteristic that I would like to highlight is uh, inter- and multidisciplinary work that brings together many perspectives. Um, there is also, of course, a, um, an institutional periphery that, that often we find ourselves in. 
So where I'm situated at KTH, the Royal Institute, um, Institute of Technology, we historians of science and technology, we live very much on the fringes of yeah, science and engineering, you could say. And I want to say that this is a good place to be. So sometimes we struggle, but actually I think we should seek such positions because they do allow us to decenter traditional traditional assumptions and perspectives, perhaps on the scientific revolution as Geert was, uh, was uh, suggesting, right? I do think that these peripheral situations help us to reinvent ourselves and our fields. At, at KTH, uh, we're very small, actually, we're a very small department and division, and we opted against the full disciplinary coverage and for a challenge-driven history of science and technology. So we focus on those challenge-driven uh, fields like extractive industries, resource problems, energy, water resources, nuclear energy, uh, resources, infrastructural system development, environmental data mining, digitalization, environmental governance structures, heritage formation. So those are all interdisciplinary fields. And as a sign of that, of that integratedness, we established um, a Center for Environmental Humanities at KTH in 2011. And Right now, we're about to establish a new center, another center for research and education at KTH to start in 2024, and that is the um, Center for Anthropocene History. And the image here that you see here uh, might look like a beautiful peripheral lake in Sweden, but it is actually a lake in Canada that just has come to fame. So. In July this year, just two, two months ago, the Anthropocene Working Group proposed the formal beginning of the Anthropocene in 1950. You might have seen that in the media. The golden spike of Crawford Lake in Canada. The lake's sediments have kept a distinct record of human and natural environmental impacts. Sedimented radioactive plutonium from nuclear weapons testing provided striking stratigraphic evidence that the traces of humans on the planet have been lasting and irreversible since the 1950s. And you could argue, of course, for a much longer time, but stratigraphically, it's marked uh, in 1952 here on that timeline. So this acknowledges in a way the Anthropocene, the age of humans as a new geological age. So Anthropocene history, this is what we thought is very timely, right? The, this new epoch will likely be formalized very soon and it will have far reaching implications for our understanding of the evolution of our planet and of the past, present and future of humans in it. The Anthropocenic changes we face reach from the molecular to the planetary and from the deep past to the distant future. So they are of scales that fundamentally affect the environmental conditions for both human and non-human life on the planet. You could say the Anthropocene collapses the distinction between human and natural history. And this is what we now propose. We need a new history that integrates human history and natural history. So the goal will be to develop a new integrated understanding of modern human and earth history. And we believe that history of science and technology, environmental history, of course, as well, can collaborate, needs to collaborate to develop fundamentally new approaches to history and bring, in a way, history of science and technology forward as a field also. The task will be to review the historical work modes, the formats and the forms of work and collaboration. Anthropocene history, we understand as an object, of course, an object of study, but it is also a self-reflexive mode of study. It compels historians of science and technology to reflect on what counts as a source, what counts as an archive in the Anthropocene, how do we narrate, how can we integrate environmental materialities and more than human lives into our political and cultural histories, 
how can we account for the vast scales, temporal and spatial scales of the Anthropocene in our historical work? And next to that epistemological dimension, there is a political dimension also to reflect. We need to reflect our situatedness as researchers in the Anthropocene. We need to account for the use of resources in an equitable way in an ac academic world that is very much built on global mobility and exchange, for instance. So how do we take that into account that we're ourselves researchers of the Anthropocene in the Anthropocene? Um, in the perspective of an Anthropocene historian, this is our take or my take on it, that, that that has been long considered as a given and a quasi natural backdrop of human history must be understood as contingent and historical. We call this elemental history. So Anthropocene history will move the Earth's elemental qualities that have been mostly at the margins of human history into the heart of historical analysis energy and mineral resources, biosphere, atmosphere, the oceans, the polar regions, and even near-Earth space or outer space. Those elements, you could say, have been treated as environmental conditions that allow human life to thrive, or as passive resources or passive sources and sinks. Anthropocene history brings these elements and spaces into the center of attention as fundamental dimensions of human existence. So beyond our usual work of history of science and technology, the task will be to recursively contrast and align geological sedimentations with the layers of human Sorry. traces that have Sorry. sedimented into history. Sorry for yeah. being rude. You have five minutes. Yeah, left. thank you. That will do fine. So this, these, these tasks, as we see them, are to relate historical to geological ways of temporalization. That's the scaling, the different scales that we work on. To relate the records and repositories of the humanities to the data sets of the natural sciences. This is very much the question of the archives and the sources. And to relate the monitoring, the recording, and the storage techniques of the sciences to the archival techniques of the humanities to understand the memory practices, like how do we memorize, how do we memorialize change on those in those very different historical formations. Um, so we to well to, to think about the future really as defining and transformative the future of history of science and technology, we must develop forms of collaborative research to understand that the historical timelines, the cultural archives, and the layers of human stories are just as meaningful and necessary to unearth as the geological timelines and sedimentations. History of science and technology is well placed and well equipped to meet these challenges and to stand out as a transformative field that addresses history not, not only as a project of defining the past and present, but also as a, as a project of defining and transforming the future. Anthropocene history emerges from the interaction and exchange of many perspectives. It relies on communication widely through societal yeah, means, media, through collaboration with education and ped uh, pedagogy, uh, for instance, through ways of creating curriculums and creating uh, of creative learning. And it can give the multidisciplinary knowledge about the Anthropocene a meaningful historical context. We can inspire creative ideas on how to deal with contemporary challenges. This is an existential task, we think here in Stockholm. It is among the most important work that historians can do in our time. And with this, I actually at the end already uh, with this summary slide uh, of the vision, focus and goals of what we propose, fundamentally new approach to history, an integration of human history and natural history with a focus on elemental history, and everything that has been treated as, in a way, a stable natural background 
in the long run and the, the, the focus on integration of the sources and uh, integration of uh, different uh, natural science and humanities histories uh, and the different time-making practices. The goal will be to create a or work towards a history of science and, and technology as being defining and transformative. Thank you so much for your attention. And I stop sharing here. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, you all three, for those amazing presentations. Uh, we have uh, a little bit more than 20 minutes left to the end of the session, and I would invite uh, the audience to uh, leave their questions uh, in our Q and answers session. Uh, we will try to answer, to respond to the questions uh, as the better we can. Uh, but I would like to start uh, with some, uh, there are more questions than, than, than provocation. So, uh, because I am, uh, a, a I started as a pure science and technology historian, but I do my, do my, my place of origin. I, I am more German than, uh, than, and other things, but I am really, really, really uh, in terms of family and origins, but I was raised in Brazil and I am live in Portugal for many, many, many years and work at the University of Porto. And so the first question provocation I would like to share with you is uh, the concept of periphery, because the concept of periphery is uh, very, very related thing. Uh, thinking about periphery in the point of view of the Latin speaking countries, for example, or the Portuguese speaking countries or the Spanish speaking countries, Sweden is center, not periphery. New Zealand is center, it's an Anglo Saxon speaking country. And think, thinking about the history of science and technology, the first version of the history of science and technology after the Second World War that mentioned by Professor Fatemon. Uh, this version is centered in the Northern European and Anglo Saxon version of the world. And you all share this vision and now are trying to move to towards a more comprehensive and global history of science and technology. And with this great and is something that we have to do, but thinking about ourselves as peripheries. And this is th this raises a methodological problem. Because uh, if we consider ourselves peripheries, if everyone considers yourself periphery, who is center? And I would like to hear a little bit about, of you on how to deal with this methodological problem. Another methodological problem that I would like to, to hear from you uh, how to deal with is. Uh, Professor Patton will talk about redefining the nature of the science concept. Uh, and this is something we are trying to do uh, since we are studying, for example, in my case, uh, uh, early modern sources produced in the colonial environments. But uh, we are dealing with an, a cultural encounter that use the concept of science and technology to seek to look to the other forms of knowledge producing with their specific degrees of rationality or their specific kinds of rationality and trying to put them into our concept of knowledge and okay, science and technology. And this raises a, a new and, and a very interesting methodological problem, how to look to other forms of knowledge, other forms of circulation of knowledge with our perspective of science and technology and how to change our perspective to not being Eurocentric looking towards those people. Uh, we are really concerned about this problem and I would love to hear uh, of you uh, uh, about that. And the last, uh, the last thing, I think it's more for Sabine, but it's uh, to all, all of us. Uh, I recently read uh, Jürgen Rehm's book, uh, 
Um, yeah, rethinking, look, rethinking, uh, rethinking knowledge for the Anthropocene, I think this uh, or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's added. The Anthropocene and science and technology history, Anthropocene is something quite also programmatic. Uh, it, it's to redefine the future. Okay. Uh, we talked about a lot of methodological problems and on how to collect data, how to treat data and so on. But there is another dimension of the methodological problems for redefining the future, that is how to deal with the ideological borders, how to deal with, uh, because we are living, how to think, how to rethink science in the age of distrust, that's our age, and how to, how to send knowledge for the future and for redefining our position in the world, dealing with those ideological borders that uh, put our position in a very political position. Mm. Uh, this is not neutral. And how you in Stockholm and other places uh, think that you could deal with that and to produce uh, uh, knowledge that could be validated for more uh, for a more broad uh, con uh, set of people that is possible. Uh, I, I don't think it if it's that the aim, but uh, uh, it's something like that. And I would leave you because so far we have no questions uh, in our Q and answer. And so I think we have time to discuss if you want to talk about it or talk about more than that. Uh, I am willing to hear you. Thank you. Well, if I may pick it up here. Uh, thank you, Fabiano, for your comments. I agree with your comments. Um, I, I think that that first of all, you mentioned periphery. I think it's a very important concept. It's a concept which um, shows some form of power relations, but it's also a cultural concept. A center will not necessarily look on the periphery, but the periphery will look at the center of 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 a system. And so the periphery is a construction that you make to align yourself with some central ideology or central doctrine. I think we need to be more conscious about, about the, the, its own history. The periphery needs to, to think for its own, not only in function of the center. So I, I think this is a, a very important point that we need to open up um, history of science from a very well Anglo-Saxon dominated center to uh, all kind of of a peripheral, but then in in, in a positive uh, sense, the peripheral histories of of, of science. I, I, I strongly support that. Um, do we need to rethink um, um, science and knowledge? I also think so. Um, it's not so new. In fact, we have artisanal knowledge, we have indigenous knowledge, we have industrial know-how. There are many many ways that we have talked about knowledge in general. But the problem is, I think, that when we write a book on history of science, on a historical topic, we only look at the scientific side of it. We do not, we never think about what is science replacing. Any new knowledge that is created replaces other knowledge. And so we need to always, when we think about the creation of new scientific knowledge, to think about what is the other knowledge that was there before the science came and, and where did it go to and, and how did it adapt or did not adapt or, or um, move around. Um, so I think we need to have an historiographical methodology that, that um, emphasizes that whenever when we, we talk about science, we also talk about all these other knowledge holders, all these other stakeholders, all these other people with expertise, with, with um, knowledge that goes into the equation. So I, I think it is. I'm less familiar with Anthropocene questions, so I, I can leave that to, to other speakers, uh, perhaps. So I go Fabiano, I might oh, oh yes, please, oh, Sabine, oh, off oh, you go. No, please. Yeah, you can self-organize. So. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking that yeah, it yeah. seems that all our uh, I mean all three talks have in a way addressed the, the center periphery question, haven't we? 
in, in, in different ways. And uh, it's great that you summarized that for us, Fabiano. Um, um, and I think it's always a relational, this is always a relational concept, of course. So you can have a, 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 a many uh, peripheries that are relating to uh, various changing centers and they can be geographical uh, of the West and where you what, rightly say that others might perceive themselves as very central um, because those are, of course, attributions that we have created, but we haven't created them randomly, I think. There is still um, a very powerful, I mean, it, as, as Gerd was saying, this is, uh, of course, like, where's, like how is power distributed? Um, and uh, it, it can be very difficult to create yourself as a central um, from a, um, a standpoint or position that is perceived as peripheral from other places. Or it can be uh, the forms of knowledge. And here Clemency was uh, um, talking about indigenous forms of knowledge um, very much. And um, in a way also uh, spoke, speaking about New Zealand um, as, a, um, as peripheral, but with that power also of the periphery to change to, to, to change um, a situation. And then you can have institutional centers or institutionalization. And that of course is where often um, uh, power is located um, about who can do what and, and uh, what, uh, with uh, the kind of resources uh, at hand. So I, I, I think that um, um, as standpoint epistemology has done, there is a, uh, there, there is a, a lot of epistemological work that needs to go um, into this the, the mapping of um, center periphery relations and uh, and how to yeah perhaps uh, overthrow them but also how to work with them creatively and I think um, we all in our ways have have done that and have tried to show both the epistemological challenges but also the the, the possibilities and also then the political possibilities um, that that go with it because it's always emancipatory I think um, to work this way and even in with the Anthropocene that has been criticized so much as a concept and it's not that that we're discarding all that um, there is also something that um, needs to be done beyond that critique I think of well, this is anthropocentric, or it's universalizing, and um, it's uh, it's a position of exceptionalism that puts humans in a in a very particular central place when it comes to Earth history. That we can, of course, look at, but still, um, there's also a power of history writing. There's a power of narrative, I think, and if that power of historical narrative is given to the geologists, I think that is a problem um, because it, it in a way questions the, what, 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 what history, what historiography can do. And this is something that we need to take up, I think. So I'm not sure what you mean by ideological borders, um, what ideologies, but um, I think there's um, heavy ideologies when it comes to how, how disciplines perceive themselves. And, and, and the power of um, creating, in a way, hegemonic narrations. And, and that is something that we need to tackle, I think, because um, there's already a lot of um, big history, deep history out there that I find, as a historian, very problematic um, and that we need to counter, I think. So there's a, that's a, a real challenge um, to work on. Okay, thank you. Uh, Clemency, and we have one question that I will uh, like to transmit you after. So okay. let's go. Oh, all right. So I'll just, I'll just, you know, add to that really interesting um, narrative from both of you. I just picking up Fabiano and your point about redefining the na nature of the science concept. We talk about hegemony or epistemological issues in indigenous knowledge. And I'll perhaps talk about a very specific example. I think that was quite. Um, you know, mind shifting for me quite recently um, in the indigenous knowledge space, there's an incredible book that's been written called Decolonizing Methodologies by an incredible Maori um, researcher called Linda Tuawai-Smith. And um, 
and it and it sort of stemmed along the work that I was doing to look at language, which of course we know is central in our studies in history and philosophy of science. And it looked at te reo, which is the um, word given to the Maori language, and um, some of the efforts um, now that all school high school qualifications need to be offered in English in, in te reo. And so you can imagine me as a mathematician had the curiosity, oh goodness, what do they do with modern calculus? <laughs> and of course, so some efforts from some really amazing um, what we might call ethno-mathematicians or perhaps more appropriately these days, culturally embedded mathematicians, Bill Barton and a team up in Auckland actually formed a committee to sit down and say, what is it? What is a theorem? You know, what is a line, a point and a plane and a circle and all these things you can imagine that you're testing high schoolers on so we can actually develop te reo. And of course the, the implications, you know, if we look at the future of the history of history of science and also the way in which language is actually an enabler um, and an epistemological, epistemological framework around um, uh, knowledges, knowledge systems, um, scholars like Linda Tuai-Smith have pointed out what you are doing, you know, is this a Trojan horse? Suddenly everybody pulled back and said, what we are doing when we actually look at trying to map these concepts from English and more Anglo-Saxon and more um, traditions of science is that we are imposing a Euclidean framework very much on this indigenous co uh, culture of inquiry that space should be made up of lines and points and planes and that when we look at things we notice circles and rectangles and not other things and that time might be linear and that you know knowledge is generated versus theorems and propositions and geometric diagrams when we're trying to do this ma mapping so out of a very um, noble and well-intentioned effort to revitalize and actually um, extend the boundaries of a living but historical language of te reo, we actually, um, you know, there's a cultural hegemony going in there of imposing ideologies around what does space look like from a mathematician's point of view, from a Western Euclidean point of view, onto these and we are losing so much incredible richness of how how early peoples might have and still do conceptualize space and time and, and and all of these concepts and so I think there's some really and and you know I I, I won't you know try to sugarcoat it dialogues in this country are, have been quite challenging in recent times um I, I think that that's symptomatic of, um, again, just stepping back, really a real engagement to try and actually understand um, how we might properly integrate or at least um, spread our net of um, what it means to think um, and recognize and, and, and produce knowledge systems. Um, so that's just a small example, I think, but but quite significant in terms of these um, these specific. I think there's redefining the nature of the science concept that you that you sort of you know it's a huge thing, Fabiani. Like talk about dropping a bomb in us. Yeah, <laughs> but these yeah, perhaps, yeah. perhaps towards these degrees of rationality that we're talking about and our default assumptions that we must constantly reassess for ourselves um in ways that actually looking at different culture of inquiries can really encourage in us and I'll, I'll just stop it there yeah uh i would like to comment but we had two questions and i i don't think, think so we'll have time to answer them properly but let's try uh first uh costa's capital flu uh he say thanks for the for, for your talks and uh, uh in the question is uh, it would be interesting to have the views of the speakers on the social resistance to the changes they propose away from the Eurocentric point of views. I think Clemens uh, talked a little bit about that. And uh, in other words, what are the resistance against what we try to do, but not the academic committee, but generally? And then Floris Winkel, uh, thank you all. Uh, I was wondering whether there, there were any specific institutional or professional development in the history of science and technology that could serve as sources of inspiration or good practice for addressing the points you have mentioned. Cooperative, decentering here, rethinking the history of science in the Anthropocene and so on, or cases that seem to be moving in the wrong directions in your opinion. Uh, I'm sorry, the audience, we don't have time to answer these questions properly but i will leave the word uh, with our with our presenters 
So uh, you can self-organize and try and try to do your best. Well, uh, very, <laughs> very briefly, if I can start again, very briefly, the resistance that I mostly uh, feel when I'm talking about these things is about this, is is from the side of the scientist. We they have the idea that science has been very successful and is is very dominant and is the only way forward, etc. So a broaden. Uh, Broden's perspective on development of, of uh, science is very often resisted by scientists themselves. On the second question, I like to refer here to, to the very successful and interesting group step, which has uh, uh, functioned for us some years, and 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 Costas, of course, knows this group very well. Uh, which perspective on the from the European uh, periphery, and that was a very productive uh, group and and, and uh, can serve as a good example of of of, of what we need uh, on a global scale. Thank you. Yeah, in one minute, if someone wants to add something. Yeah, I would uh, say that the social resistance against, for instance, Anthropocene history, uh, you could think of climate denialism, I mean, in a very extreme form, in a way, it's, it's, it's in a, the idea that what humans do do, do does not have impact on, on the earth in a way that this will be reflexive. So this, of course, we see every day that uh, uh, whatever humans do, it's of a scale that is too limited to have a larger effect. And that, I think, counters, in a way, the Anthropocene history project. Um, and we see that as a, as a problematic um, resistance, I'd say. OK, uh, I think we, we are on our time. So I would like to thank you all three for the great presentations. Very interesting and really enriching discussion. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I would like to keep in touch with you. I will send an email uh, in a couple of hours or a couple of days. So <laughs> <laughs> time is related. Uh, and uh, I think uh, after that, mm -hmm. uh, the session will be ended from, yeah, thank you very much. So thank you to our audience too. Thank you, the audience.